Kurtovsky's Theorem, a Math 141 final project by David Kabatingen, Ken Cole, and Petr Peshev. In this video, we will state Kurtovsky's Theorem, cover the necessary background information to prove the theorem, outline the proof of the theorem, and discuss some related topics in mathematics. The statement of Kuratovsky's theorem is that a graph is non-planar if and only if it has a subgraph, which is a subdivision of K5 or K33. Take, for example, this non-planar graph G. We have identified in red and green the six vertices that correspond to the vertices of K33. So we can take that subgraph of G and see that it is a subdivision of K33. Before we can jump into the main proof, there are some preliminaries we have to go over. First, we'll talk about planar graphs and their properties. Then we'll define what K5 and K33 are. Next, subgraphs and subdivisions. And then two connected graphs and their properties. We define a graph to be planar if some embedding of it onto the plane has no edge intersections. So this is an example of a planar graph because it has a good embedding. However, this is an example of a non-planar embedding of a graph. With this graph, we could wonder whether any of the possible embeddings are planar. On the left here, we have K5, which is the complete graph on five vertices. This means that there's an edge between any two vertices. On the right, we have K33, which is the bipartite graph on six vertices. This means that there's two groups of three vertices, and each vertex is connected to every vertex in the other group, and there's no edge between any two vertices in the same group. Euler's formula states that V minus E plus F is equal to two for convex polyhedra, but we will generalize this to all planar graphs by using stereographic projection. First, we see that we can take a graph embedded on the surface of a sphere and under stereographic projection get a planar graph. The top face was outlined in red to illustrate where the outside face comes from in the planar graph. Next, we show the other direction, where we can take a planar graph and map it to a graph on the surface of a sphere through the inverse of stereographic projection. A subgraph is defined as a subset of vertices and edges of some original graph. An important observation to make is that if the original graph is planar, then all of its subgraphs must be planar as well. This follows from the fact that since none of the original edges intersected, then no subset of those edges intersect either. A subdivision is obtained by replacing an existing edge in a graph with two new edges connected by a new vertex. Since edges don't necessarily have to be straight, we observe that if the subdivision of some graph is planar, then the original graph must have been planar as well since we can replace the sequence of two edges by one not necessarily straight edge. By the contrapositive, we can conclude that if a graph is non-planar, then all of its subdivisions must also be non-planar. We are now going to discuss two connected graphs. We define a graph to be two connected if it cannot be separated into two components by removing a single vertex. So this is an example of a two connected graph. However, this graph is not too connected. When we remove the center vertex, we are left with a graph with two components. We call this vertex a cut vertex. Conceptually, a two connected graph is all in one piece. Next, we're going to prove a theorem regarding two connected graphs that states any two vertices u and v are contained within some cycle. We prove this by induction on the distance between u and v, where the base case initially assumes that u and v are adjacent. Given that the graph is two connected, we know that if we remove the edge uv, there will still exist some path from u to v in the resulting graph. Then, by simply re-adding the edge uv, we can complete the cycle. Now, assuming the inductive hypothesis that this holds for any vertices distance d apart, we can prove the inductive step for when u and v are distance d plus one apart. First, we label the point w, the point immediately preceding v in the path from u to v. The distance from u to w is now d, which means that by our inductive hypothesis, there is some cycle that contains u and w. Now if we were to remove w, we know that there still must exist some path from v to u since our graph is two connected. 
In our visual, this path intersects the cycle containing U and W in order to demonstrate that we make no assumptions regarding the uniqueness of this path. Lastly, if we re-add W with all of its edges, we can complete a cycle containing U and V. Now that we're finished with the preliminaries, we can move on to proving the first direction of Kuratowski's theorem. This direction is that G is non-planar if G contains a subdivision of K5 or K33. We've established so far that a subdivision of a non-planar graph is non-planar, and that if a subgraph of a graph is non-planar, then that graph is non-planar. So if we assume that K5 and K33 are non-planar, then we have the first direction of Kuratowski's theorem. Now, we'll prove that K33 is non-planar. So we start with Euler's formula, V minus E plus F equals 2. We see that there are six vertices, so it's become 6 minus e plus f equals 2. We see there are 9 edges, so 6 minus 9 plus f equals 2. And doing the math out on this gives us f equals 5. As we can see, it is impossible to have a 3-edge face, as no 3-edge paths can be closed because they end on the opposite side that they start on. Therefore, each face must have at least 4 edges, so 4f must be less than or equal to 2e because 4f is the minimum number of face edge pairs and 2e is the maximum number of faces that the edges could appear in. Plugging 9 in for e and solving for f gives us f is less than or equal to 4.5. We can combine the two sides of this and end up with 5 is less than or equal to 4.5, which is a contradiction. So k33 is non-planar because it does not satisfy Euler's formula. Proof that K5 is non-planar is similar. As before, we write down the known values, 5 vertices and 10 edges, into Euler's formula. Now, we do not have the same restriction on edges per face as K33, but any planar graph has at least 3 edges per face. So we can use the bound 3f less than or equal to 2e. As before, our two different solutions for f show us that k5 cannot satisfy Euler's formula. So to recap, since k5 and k33 are non-planar, all of their subdivisions must be non-planar. And if g contains any of those subdivisions, then g must also be non-planar. The second direction of Kurtovsky's theorem states that if G is a non-planar graph, then it must contain a subdivision of K5 or K33. We'll proceed to proving this by contradiction. Assume that there exist some non-planar graphs that do not contain subdivisions of K5 or K33. That is, consider the set of all counterexamples. Now let G be the graph with the fewest edges in the set of counterexamples. Thus, if we were to remove an edge from G, the resulting graph would be planar. Next, we'll prove that G is too connected. Assume for the sake of contradiction that G is not too connected. This means that there's a cut vertex somewhere in G. Take this graph here as an example. If we split G at its cut vertex, then one of the two remaining pieces must still be non-planar, and we arrive at a smaller counterexample which gives us a contradiction with G being minimal, so G must have been too connected. The second fact we can observe about G is that all of its vertices have degree greater than two. We can prove this by assuming for the sake of contradiction that the degree of some V is less than or equal to two. We know that V can't have degree zero, since that would make G disconnected. We also know that V can't have degree one, since then U would be a cut vertex. If V has degree two, then let U and W be the vertices adjacent to V. Then, consider the case where u and w are adjacent to each other. The graph h, obtained by removing v from g, is a planar graph by the minimality of g. If we embed h, we can then reinsert v next to the edge uw into the graph to get a planar embedding of g. This contradicts the non-planarity of g. If u and w are not adjacent to each other, then consider the graph h obtained by removing v from g and adding in the new edge uw. This graph has exactly one fewer edge than g, so it too must be planar. By subdividing the edge uw into uv and vw, we can again obtain a planar embedding of g, thus no vertex can have degree less than or equal to 2. The last fact that we want to show about G is that there is some edge UV that we can remove and have G minus UV still be too connected. 
This can be seen by drawing G as a cycle with paths along its outside. From this representation, it is more clear that, along outer paths, there are removable edges of the sort we are looking for. The proof of this uses concepts that we won't get into here. The relevant fact is that such an edge does exist. We are now ready to prove the theorem. Consider the graph g minus uv obtained by removing the edge from the last statement. This graph is planar due to the minimality of g. It is also too connected, so by our earlier lemma, there must be a cycle containing u and v. We want to take g minus uv and embed it so that a particular cycle containing u and v is along the outside. We will call this cycle c. We embed g minus uv so that c encloses more regions of the graph than any other cycle containing u and v could. Note that we are only drawing the relevant portions of the graph, but plenty of other edges could exist. Also note that the edges we are drawing here are really paths in the graph. We can't have any extra paths on the upper part of C, since then there would be a cycle which contains more regions than C. The same goes for the lower part. This would mean that C is not what we said it is. Now, since G is non-planar, we shouldn't be able to embed UV by drawing it outside of C. So there must be a connection between two points on the upper and lower parts, which we will call VI and VJ. The path VI, VJ prevents UV from being drawn on the outside. In order to block UV from being drawn inside C, we must also have an obstruction on the inside of C. This obstruction also has to block VI, VJ from being drawn inside of C, since otherwise we could just draw it inside and draw UV on the outside. Up to equivalence, there are only four types of obstructions we could draw here. The first looks like this. However, let's draw the edge UV in, completing our drawing of G. This reveals that this structure is a subdivision of K33, so G actually contains K33 as a subdivision of one of its subgraphs. The second looks like this. By the same method as before, we can see that G also contains K33 as a subdivision of one of its subgraphs. The third looks like this. This structure, again, gives a subdivision of K33. Now, the fourth obstruction looks like this. This structure actually gives a subdivision of K5. In all of the four cases, the result is a contradiction. We assume that G contained neither of the two graphs. With this, we are left to conclude that there are no non-planar graphs like G. This proves the theorem. We have now shown Kuratowski's theorem. This is a powerful result. It completely describes the planar graphs. A natural extension to the question is, which graphs can be embedded into other topological spaces? We saw that the graphs which can be embedded onto the sphere are exactly all of the planar graphs. But we will now show that some non-planar graphs can be embedded into other spaces without crossing edges. K33, which is non-planar, can actually be embedded on a torus. So we'll take K33 here, put it on our representation of a torus, take the horizontal edges, go around the boundary, move these other edges around the boundary, and then the last edge vertical on the boundary. This gives us an embedding on the torus. We can also embed K5 onto the torus. To do so, we place K5 on the familiar representation of the torus and redraw some edges through the boundary so that none are crossing. We would like to thank our professor, Baina Shishiku, Grant Sanderson from 3Blue1Brown for the Python library which we use to create these animations, Mary Radcliffe for the notes on Kuratowski's theorem, and the music is from Ambient One by Brian Eno. <laughs>